that Campbell goes about giving a detailed theory of the sense of perceptual demonstratives is by drawing on the cognitive science or psychology of attention. So in this video, I will give some background understanding of a particular theory and some studies done by uh, in the cognitive science, uh, cognitive science of the nature of attention. So the the first idea in order to understand these theories of this this theory of attention is something something called the binding problem. So the binding problem is as follows. Our visual system detects very various different properties in the environment around us. So these properties of for instance shape, color, and orientation, okay? So based on the signals that our retina on our eyes are picking up, our visual system is able to detect various different properties all around us, okay? So again, there's different kinds of colors and shapes in the environment. Now, what the binding problem is, is as follows. How is it that various groups of properties come to be, come to be represented as of the same object? So in our conscious experience and how it actually seems to us when we're, we are visually experiencing the world, we don't just experience a bunch of different, uh, we don't just experience many different properties hanging around, okay? Rather, we experience actual objects. And what an object is or what an object involves is many different properties kind of connected into a bundle, so to speak. So if I look at, for instance, this orange in front of me, I don't just see the property of orangeness and the property of roundness kind of hanging around in front of me. Rather, I see this orangeness and this shape of roundness together as the properties of a single object, okay? And so before that, in my experience, I'm able to see that, my visual system, that things that are going on below the hood, so to speak, in how my brain or mind is processing the information in the environment, is that the idea is that it picks up this property of orangeness and it picks up this property of uh, shape, of being round, and then before I'm able to consciously experience the object, these two properties are bound together as about the same object by my visual system, okay? And the question is, how is it that my uh, the visual system binds together pro properties, various properties that it detects in the environment to be represented as of the same object? So there is one famous proposal for how the binding problem is solved from the cognitive psychologist uh, and Treisman or Treisman propose that the binding of features in perception occurs by attention selecting a perceived location. So figure one illustrates how multiple features are grouped together by attention given sameness of perceived location. So let me go through this figure to try to give you an impression of how this theory works. Okay, so on the top left here are, dif are different features of color, different colors that are detected in the environment that's being perceived. Okay, so here are the different uh, properties or features of color. So there's red somewhere, there's yellow somewhere, there's blue somewhere, okay? And then on the right, are the representations of the information about the properties of the orientation of objects. So for example, the orientation of something is whether it's facing away from you or facing towards you or to the side, etc. Okay? So there's these other properties or features of objects, their orientation, which are represented on the top right. And then there's this 
one frame or map of locations. Okay, so these locations are just different areas basically in your visual field in front of you. Okay, and each feature, for example, color, for example, color or, or orientation, that also be some for shape. Each feature is attached to a particular location on this map of locations. Then the way that different features are bound together is that your attention selects a certain location on this map of locations. And when your attention selects that location, what happens is all the features, all the different features of color, orientation, shape, are bound together to be represented as of some particular object. Okay, so on your different map of locations, there's the color red here and an orientation, say, facing away from you. And then when your attention focuses on that location, it binds together those two features, and so what you perceive is a red object that is facing away from you. So for example, imagine, say, a toy car that is red and you're looking at it from behind. And so when you bind together the features of redness and the orientation, but in terms of in terms of both of those features being at the same location, you then are related or represent an actual the actual red object as the thing which both those features are collected in. Okay, so this is the model of how attention works and how attention in our perception of the world binds together the different features that are detected. So a core piece of evidence for this proposal is a certain kind of uh, search paradigm or study. Okay, and, we, and what you can do is you can actually uh, do it for yourself. So I'll walk you through it right now to get a, an idea of uh, the motivation for this view of attention as solving the binding problem. Okay, so in front of us here are a bunch of crosses with, with and these, each cross consists of two bars. One bar is horizontal and the other is vertical and then uh, the bars are either shaded or not shaded. So looking at this field of crosses, suppose someone asks you to identify or look for the white vertical bar. Okay, so you're asked to identify the white vertical bar. Now I'm going to give you a second to find the white vertical bar. So not to spoil the fun, but I managed to find it in that time. And the white vertical bar is down here at the bottom left. Okay, another thing you can do too is try to find the gray horizontal bar. So it's already here as well. Okay, but maybe if you forget this, then try to find it again. And the gray one. And the point though is that in trying to find, when you're asked to find the white vertical bar or the gray horizontal bar, it takes you some time. Okay, so if you just look at this, you don't immediately see the white vertical bar, okay? You have to look around. And the idea is that the reason why it takes you some time to find it is that the two features, the feature of being white, the color feature, and the shape feature of being, uh, well, the shape, the shape feature of uh, being a bar, the, the color feature of being white, and the orientation feature of being vertical, okay? These are three different properties that your visual system detects. In order for these three properties to be grouped together as one thing, i.e. a white vertical bar, something that has those three features, it requires that you attend to that location. And when you attend to that, and only when you attend to the location are those features connected all together. And so that you can then recognize that it's the white vertical bar. So imagine instead of all these kind of fancy crosses, there is just, say, like a bunch of, say, five to ten lines, okay? Now imagine that 
all of the lines, or all but two of the lines were green and two of the lines were blue. And all of these lines were the exact same, except for two of them had some different color. Now you'd be able to see immediately the ones that had a different color. Okay, that's because the color is just a single feature and it doesn't require your attention to bind a single feature. Your you, the, the single feature of color is, is kind of automatically picked up by your visual system. So if you had a bunch of different bars and one of them, one or two of them were some different color, you'd be able to tell right away where those were, okay? But here, because we're not asking, you know, to find something of this color that all the other ones don't have, instead what we're asking is to find something that is a white vertical bar or a gray horizontal bar, i.e. something that is a collection of different features that takes more time because you have to search the space and, and attend to the right thing before and then once you attend to it these three different features will be bound together and then you can then identify the white vertical bar or the gray horizontal one okay so the fact that in experiments like this where you're told to find something some collection of features the fact that it takes time and it requires a subject to attend to it is evidence for the view that it is a tension that binds together the features uh, that our visual system detects. And uh, the attention binds them together as about the same object based on those features being at the same perceived location. Okay, so the philosophical upshot and the upshot of this, which Campbell will exploit or get, grab hold of in developing the kind of sense is that attention, and that's a typo, so this should just say attention, attention binds properties together so that in perception and thought, a subject can be related to the physical objects around them. So the idea is that if there was no attention, then you would, you would not be able to perceive and think about any particular objects. All there would be would be different um, arrays of properties, but none of these properties would be bound together and you wouldn't be able to actually perceive or think about actual physical objects. But the idea is that what attention does is when you attend to various things that you see, you're thereby able to actually perceive objects as external things with various properties. And so, and the reason why attention does that is that is because attention binds together uh, in our perception and therefore allows in our thought the different features that are picked up. And, and in virtue of that, attention allows us to be, uh, to think and talk about, uh, to notice, to see and think and talk about actual physical objects. So in the next video, we will see how this idea is developed, this philosophical idea is developed by Campbell in giving his theory of the sense of perceptual demonstratives. Um, but one final thing I want to leave you with as we're talking about the cognitive science is a more recent study which some people think poses a problem for Treisman's. It might be Treisman's, but it doesn't matter. Um, in any case, this more recent study many people think is a problem for Treisman's theory of attention and it's very influential and it's from the cognitive psychologist Politian and, this, and so let me quickly explain to you this study and mention some of the consequences of it and as something that is worth thinking about. So there, there are more recently uh, very influential experiments by Politian um, and these have been taken to show that visual binding, so the, the way in which the visual system binds together different features, that binding is preconceptual and not dependent on location. Okay, so let me explain to you the study, and then I'll explain to you these consequences uh, of why of about the preconceptual and uh, non-dependence on location. So the study starts, so the subject of the study is looking at a screen where there are a number of 
dots or circles, shaded circles on the screen, okay? And then about four or five of these circles will flash. So these kind of, this drawing around these circles indicates that at the first stage of the experiment, several of these circles will flash or be highlighted on the screen, okay? And then, so they're highlighted for a bit, and then they become non-unhighlighted. And then in the second part of the experiment, all of the different circles start moving around. And as they're moving around, they um, will change their properties. So they'll change their color, potentially their shape. And also in some cases too, it might actually disappear. So it'll blink out of existence and then reappear as if it was moving around. Um, but sometimes it'll, the things will actually blink out of existence and then come back um, and just keep on moving around normally, okay? And then, so that happens for some period of time. And then the subject is asked to re-identify which of the four circles were originally um, so highlighted, okay? So again, only, so about four of them are highlighted and they all start moving around. And then after that, subject has to re-identify which ones were the ones that were originally highlighted, okay? So the subject has to be able to keep track of these four, or of the, of, the, of the highlighted circles, okay? And the idea is, and what the results show is that if anywhere between one and, and about four or five of these circles, if they're highlighted and then they move around and change their properties, at about four or five of them, the subject will be reliably be able to re-identify them. So what that means is that a subject is able to keep track of about four or five different objects, regardless of as their properties change and as their properties and locations change. Um, and then be and so the subject is able to re, uh, keep track of about four or five different things, regardless of the changing properties and location. Okay, and also in some cases, as I mentioned, the thing might disappear, then reappear. But nonetheless, the subject is able to um, have, keep track of it. Okay. So what that, what that suggests, or the problem that poses for thinking about location as being the binding feature is how is it that if location is a binding feature, or sorry, if, how is it that if location is the thing that is binding the features together of, say, shape and color, how is it that the location can do that if the, things are, the location is changing, i.e. you're tracking the thing as it moves? Okay, so that's this first part about dependence on location. The second thing about preconceptual is as follows. And in order to understand how this experiment shows how visual binding is preconceptual, we have to get on the table certain uh, concepts from cognitive science. And these are different con the concepts of parallel versus serial processing. So what it means for something to be, a, to be parallel processing is that a parallel processing system can perform multiple tasks at once without a significant drop-off in performance. But it can only do multiple tasks up to a point where its capacity is exceeded. So once it hits a certain amount of tasks that it's able to do in parallel, the performance completely collapses and is not able to, do, to perform any of them. Okay. And what this study shows is that the way in which tracking of visual objects it seems to be a parallel process. So if only one of them flashes, the subject is reliably able to re-identify that one thing. If two of them or three of them or four of them flash, then the subject is just as reliably able to re-identify those two, three, or four things, okay? So the ability to track objects as they move around is one that is a parallel process. So you have about four or five different slots in your visual system for tracking different objects. So whether you're tracking one or two or three or four, you're able to do each of those things just as well. Okay, 
But after about five or six, if you are asked to track more than five or six things, you, the subjects are stop being able to reliably at all be identified. Okay? So you just don't have more than about four or five slots in your visual system for tracking objects. But you can track up to four or five in a parallel way. Now, in contrast to parallel processing, there is serial processing. So a serial processing system can perform only one task at once. And if it's assigned more than one, the system must cycle between the tasks with a linear, uh, consequent linear decline in performance. So the idea is that conceptual um, processing or the conceptual activity in our mind, so conceptual thought, is serial. Okay? So imagine someone asks you to solve a very difficult math problem. Okay? That will take you, let's say, 10 minutes. And now suppose someone asks you to solve two very difficult math problems. The way in which you go about doing that is in a serial way. So you can't be working on both at the same time. So what you'll do is you'll switch between the two problems. Okay? So that means that solving two math problems will take you about 20 minutes, say. And the way you'll spend your time is by maybe doing the first one and then the second one, or maybe switching between them, okay? But the idea is that this is a kind of serial processing, and that is what's happening with our conceptual thought, our reflective, slow, um, kind of conscious thinking. It's serial, okay? You're doing one thing at a time. And, but preconceptual things, so more automatic aspects of our cognition, are generally parallel. And what the subject's performance at tracking things shows is that this ability to track things is a preconceptual ability. And that's because a subject is just as easily able to track one or two or three or four things without a serial or like a, a linear decline in performance. But once you hit about four or five different things, you completely stop to be able stop being able to track that many things. Okay, so there's so what the kind of processing that happens for visual binding seems to be preconceptual because parallel processing is a mark of the preconceptual, and serial processing is a mark of the conceptual. Okay. In the next video, I will go over how Campbell draws on, draws on Treisman's work on the binding problem to give an account of the sense of perceptual demonstratives.